Hello, everyone, and welcome, Rachel. It's such a pleasure to have you here today with uh, what a wonderful, distinguished career. Uh, I just bought something on Etsy last week. I have fantastic products from uh, for my home. I've, I've moved into a new home, so I'm real excited about that and hearing all about Etsy. Also hearing about your almost 20 years at Disney and hearing about your board work at the New York Times and other, other board roles, as well as your other CFO roles. We have a lot to talk about. And what I'd like to start with is uh, many people in their career have a turning point in their career. And you and I were talking the other day about your career and a particular turning point there. Can you tell us about that? What was the situation and what happened? Yes. And before I dive in, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I love that you have this podcast. It's a it's a great opportunity. I learned something listening to the CFOs that preceded me on in other podcasts. So it's 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 a great forum. Um, yeah, I, I started Disney um, at Disney right after I graduated from business school. I worked one year after college and dove right into business school and then joined Disney as a financial analyst. And I worked there for a number of years. And then I, um, in 1990, I had my first child. And my plan um, at the time, one piece of advice I had gotten was to, to stay in the workforce in some way, any way that you can. Um, uh, even after you have children. And my plan had been to um, to take some time off and, and I told them to go ahead and backfill me. And I had a really progressive um, boss in my, I was in a corporate operations planning role and he kind of said, I'm going to make you a deal you can't refuse. Why don't you come back and work half time? I feel like I'm going to get 75% of the productivity out of you um, and pay you only 50% of the time. It's a good deal for me. And I think it's a good opportunity for you. And I did. And I did that for a number of years after that. And I thought that was a really, um, a really key moment because I otherwise might have left for a while and never been able to return back to the workforce. And um, Disney wasn't doing stuff like that at the time. This was just this one wonderful boss who had the idea and it really worked for me for a while while, while my kids were young. What a terrific story. And your boss was Byron Pollock, right? That's correct. Byron yeah. Pollitt was at Disney for a lot of years and then went on to the Gap and to, to Visa, took Visa Public and other things. And i um, not sure he'll ever listen to this podcast, but I attribute a lot of that um, opportunity to keep my career going to him and his creative thinking. Well, I'll have to send it to him. I'm sure he'll, uh, I'll send him a podcast because I'm sure he'll, he'll be happy to hear your story about that. Now, when you have this program of working part-time, you can always say, well, you're officially working part-time, but we're gonna give you so much work, you actually have full-time work and you don't have time for your family. Uh, did they do a good job of balancing work and, and family life? And would, what were some lessons learned that you can tell us if we wanna to try to do that in other companies? Yeah, I you know, it was, like I had said, it wasn't, this wasn't a program at Disney. So it was sort of self-designed by myself and the, and the people that I supported. Um, I sort of made it my goal that nobody should actually be aware that I was working half time. It should feel to everybody that I was present or reachable all the time. And so I um, I was in the office on my designated days, but my I you know I had childcare set up that I when I wasn't in the office I was I was needed at home, and that didn't always work. So here's an example. I, um, one day we were, this is, I'm dating myself here, but we were making a presentation to Frank Wells, who was the chief operating officer of Disney at the time. And as you would expect, somebody who's in a very senior role in a very large company, his schedule didn't exactly run on time, but I didn't have any flexibility built into my, into my childcare. I had to leave. So I've actually missed that meeting. In hindsight, I can't believe that I that I actually walked out the door and just said, sorry, I'm going to have to miss this, this meeting. But I, to, to me, I really did make my priority, my, were my kids. And I was willing to accept um, sort of the parking of my career for, for a bit or putting it on a low boil for a while and making the, my kids, uh, my priority. I, I don't regret it at all. They, they were, I was there for them when they really needed me when they were really young. And I'm not, I'm not at all uh, displeased with where I landed in my career over time. Well, it's terrific that that you made that uh, those decisions and you stuck to it and, and it worked out well. Congratulations. So let's go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? Uh, did, were you always interested in business and finance? Did, was it inevitable you were going to become an important chief financial officer? 
So geographically, I grew up in California. Um, I still actually divide my time between California and New York. Um, I was actually born in the Bay Area and spent most of my life growing up in Los Angeles. And I um, spent a good part of my time in the Bay Area. I went to college at UC Berkeley, where I studied psychology and not um, finance or um, any kind of business uh, uh, curriculum. But I, I focused on um, organizational behavior. And my I really liked the psychology of business, I guess. And I, I, I thought at first um, I would follow in my parents' footsteps. They're both psychotherapists. My dad got his PhD at Stanford, which is where I was, that was where I was born. That's why I started my life in, in the Bay Area. And I thought I would also do PhD in psychology, but I'm also very efficient. <laughs> and I realized, yeah, I can maybe get from point A to point B a little faster by getting a business degree in organizational behavior rather than a PhD in organizational behavior. And I, I found myself going to business school where I did emphasize in organizational behavior. But while I was there, I also took a lot of finance because I wanted to round out that quantitative side to my background, which therefore very well qualified me for a uh, financial analyst job at this really cool company called Disney. So I felt good about taking that financial analyst job, but I was going more to the company, not to not to the finance piece of it. I thought I could really, I liked the brand and I thought I could get a really good further education by working at a company that um, had such a, a wealth of talent to learn from. I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to grow up in a family with two psychotherapists as parents. That must be fascinating when they're constantly using their skills on you as a child. I, I am very proud of them. My parents are 90 and 92, and my dad is still working. If you can, he down to sees patients by Zoom. If he figured out Zoom, and I'm very proud of them. And I, I do sometimes wonder how I came out normal, or maybe I'm not all that normal. Who knows? <laughs> well, they were very good at what they did. That's great. <laughs> So you joined, did you join Disney soon after Michael Eisner and Frank Wells came in? Was that? Yeah, I think they started in. I can, if I could just uh, set the pattern here, younger people probably don't understand how dramatic a change this was. Because Disney, when I was growing up, was, they, 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 this was pre-Lion King. They had a series of terrible movies. The company was struggling and failing and, and people thought, you know, Disney was old news. It was, you know, Mickey Mouse cartoon. And then they brought in this new leadership team and completely turned it around. And you were part of that, right? Yeah, he, he they started in 1984, the two of them. And I started in 1986. I can give myself absolutely zero credit for the turnaround. <laughs> I was really a whippersnapper and learning at the feet of geniuses. Um, and they were absolutely brilliant in the concept. Before then, the company had been rolling out one crown jewel after the next releasing things like Snow White or Dumbo or whatever every seven years. And there's a reason for that. They catch a new sort of cohort of, of children about every seven years. There was no home video um, or DVD or now we have streaming. There was nothing like that. So it was really releasing um, these things back to theatrical and eventually in, into um, VHS. And the other brilliant, so what the first brilliant thing was, why don't we develop a whole movie studio that can actually capture not only children, but a middle audience. Like for instance, one of their early films was the movie Splash with um, Daryl Hannah and Tom, and Tom Hanks. The second brilliant thing, if anyone's been to a Disney theme park long ago, they used to have a book of tickets that you'd get when you walked in and they, everybody wanted these e-ticket if you've heard the classic they they changed the model on the tick on the tickets for for the rides and they said let's charge one entry fee and it immediately brought the the average price per um visit up to a level of a whole book of e-tickets if if you will and that just changed the economics of the entire company it became a cash cow their studio was successful and they were generating cash to the theme parks and it a whole lot of goodness followed from that i um you know i entered in Financial as a financial analyst in TV animation, another brilliant idea. Why not put some of these classic, you know, wonderful Disney animated talent on television? And um, can take no credit for either the studio idea or the um, theme park idea. But I did get to learn about all these businesses from different parts in my career. There are different ways of running large organizations from a finance organization or a business unit organization. Sometimes they're very centralized. Oracle is typically very centralized. Disney had many different business units, right? You had theme parks, you had movies, you had television. 
And for the finance team, then you could work in one or another of the business units and you can move around. And my understanding is that that created what I call an academy company for finance experts. There are so many talented finance experts who came out of Disney like you and like Byron Pollitt. Could you talk about how the finance organization was was designed at Disney and, and did they think about your career of giving you increasing responsibility? How did that whole thing work? I definitely benefited from the fact that Disney is a large enterprise. And as you point out, every division in Disney had a a structure where there was a head of that division and then a very senior CFO of that division. And that structure cascaded down. So I'll use an example of consumer products where I spent a good good chunk of my time um, in the, the latter half of my career there where consumer products would have a head, a CFO of that division and then there would be a head of Walt Disney Records and a head of Walt Disney, it was called computer software at the time, and a head of um, the merchandise licensing, and they each had CFOs as well. And so there really was a nicely structured ladder within each of the divisions throughout the company. I was able, I, I mentioned that I started in um, uh, TV animation, and I was able to sort of bootstrap my way to other parts of the company. And at the time, so I'm dating myself all the way back to 1986, there was no formal program to rotate through a division or even it wasn't even made that easy to see where there were open positions. But I was able to figure out, oh, I see a a promotion opportunity for me over here in network TV and then a promotion opportunity for me over here in the corporate group. And through the relationships that I built, I was able to raise my hand and say, I want to. I want to be able to move throughout. And I I really loved that because you could spend an entire career at Disney and actually traverse different industries. And I actually also had the opportunity to hold different functional positions. So I was mostly finance at my time at Disney, but I also had a technology role for a few years. I had what we called an operational role um, for a few years. And that was a like you're like a whole new education to be able to get different functional experience and different industry experience all within one one company. Um, I, I don't think they've formalized it to any extent since I, I've been gone since 2005. So it's so it's been a while now. But, it, you know, I, I think through and I always advise my own teams about this. It's a two way street. You've got to take some agency yourself to figure out what you want to do next in your career. And that was pretty, pretty rich for me at Disney and for others to be able to to make those um, progressions. That's terrific. Tell us about uh, a project you worked on or a decision you were involved in as in your finance role at, at Disney, which had a big impact on the company. Um, you know, I, I, um, I had both corporate roles and divisional roles. And I think I gave you an example when we talked last that when I was in the, the corporate role, our team supported um, Frank Wells, who was the, the chief operating officer of the company to make really big decisions around should we build a new theme park and should we, um, you know, build a new hundred million dollar ride in um, Epcot center, because we did the financial kicking of the tires on those sorts of decisions. Whereas the strategic planning group, the sort of the sister to the operations planning and analysis group um, had more of the, creative role of what's the biggest idea we can think of and really supported Michael Eisner and um, by Bob, Bob, Bob Iger, who was the, the CEOs that were there while I was um, in the company. So we had more of the finance rigor and our counterparts had more of the sort of innovation um, rigor. And those were very good uh, checks and balances, I think. So for instance, and we, you know, I have so much admiration for Michael Eisner, so this is not meant as a negative, but he'd walk through a theme park and he'd have all kinds of ideas about, we need to make more entertainment in this queue. So people are going to be waiting a very long time, or we need a ride over in the, in this land to get to draw more of the um, uh, the audience into the back park, part of the park. And as soon as he said it, engineers would be off or Imagineers, we called them, would be off building it. And then Frank Wells would turn to us and say, can you analyze this for me? (laughs) What's the economics of this thing? And so we were really a good check and balance. I feel good that we were able to add value and process to what things we ought to be investing in. Um, Very large um, decisions like 
stock splits and dividend policies and things like that were sort of part of what we did as um, a finance team there. Then I shifted to an operational role. And I, the example I gave you is one of the first things they asked me to do was to analyze a very small marketing campaign. And, it, you know, once you get on that side of the, the, uh, the coin where you're, you're in the business itself, hundred thousand dollar decisions really matter. And so I was sort of gobsmacked for a minute, like, you want me to actually write a deck on this? And they said, yes, we actually want you to write a deck on this because before I'd been working on these very large scale things, but didn't ever really get close to the action. So I've seen both both sides of that world. So you, you had both financial analysis on $100,000 decisions and $100 million decisions at the exactly. same company. When, when you're deciding on building a new attraction at Epcot for $100 million, when you're not charging separately for that ride, how, how do you even analyze it? How, is it a function of you think the overall uh, attendance at the park will grow? Is is that part of it? Or what, what are the other inputs? Yeah, I mean, they. Um, we're, I'm going so far back now, but we would look at things like, you know, uh, attendance, attendance. There was a metric called the, theoretical hourly ride capacity, which is how many people can, how many rides can people get on in one day in a theme park? And it directly correlates with people's exit surveys on how happy, how much they enjoyed their experience, which then correlates with how likely they are to, to come back or spend, you know, it's an expensive day to spend a day in any one of Disney's theme parks. And so you, we would look at what's the impact on the THRC, this theoretical hourly ride capacity. We also looked at things like how much is it costing us to build this thing and can we do it? Can we do the same with less? Like, can you outsource to Bechtel? Can you, you know, what what are the what are the alternatives to the, you know, how well how um, solid is the ask on what what's going to be built and how it's going to be built? So we 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 did all kinds of tire kicking in that way. Well, first of all, how much fun because everyone loves Disney, and so you were working at a really interesting company with terrific leaders. Uh, but then after 20 years, almost a, a career, you you went to Yahoo, which was a very interesting change, and you were in a senior role there. What was your thinking there about the, the transition? What was the difference in working day-to-day -day at Disney versus working day-to-day -day at Yahoo at that time? And it, once again, for people who don't remember what Yahoo was like during the internet boom, it's, a, it's different from what Yahoo is today, right? <laughs> it was a very different time. Exactly. Um Oh, I have so much to say about that change. And first of all, that was in 2005. You know, Yahoo was one of the inventors of the internet. I mean, it started out as Jerry and Dave's um, guide to the World Wide Web. You used to have to type in this long string of words and, and um, keystrokes to just find CNN.com or whatever. And so they created a guide to make that easy and it blossomed from there. The year I entered Yahoo, the, the prior year they had hired something like 3000 people. And I kid you not at Disney, I would have been hard pressed to hire three people because at Disney, we were in the mode of austerity and um, headcount freezes. And we, there had been a voluntary um, resignation program implemented. And it was um, kind of in a period of time, like how do we scale and, and and harvest profit and not in growth mode? And Yahoo was the exact opposite. Um, two other notable things about Yahoo. When I first got there, these are the people that invented the internet. So there really were PhD scientists all over the place, smartest people you'll ever meet and really you know, steeped in technology. Like how do you build a good search algorithm and make money from it? And at Disney, they had a group called the Technology Innovation Division or something like that. Like they really believed themselves to be technology forward. But when I got to Yahoo, I'm like, wow, you know, they don't know anything. This is this is the real deal here. So I really had a dip in the pool of what it means to be a technology company for the first time. And by the way, I've only worked in internet tech businesses since then. Disney was really more traditional media. And um, the the um, the last point I'll make is that it thrust me. Yahoo was like the size of one whole consumer products division, so that was one of Disney's smaller divisions. And so it was the right size for me. It sort of thrust me at the top of the heap of that division, where before I had been sort of mired somewhere in the middle of the consumer products division. Put me right into. Um, the executive suite, very often sitting around the table with the CEO, COO, CFO of the company. I was working for the CFO of the company. And it 
it really was um, the reason they brought me was to bring in some big company process and experience from the things that I had learned at the Academy of Disney and introduce them to Yahoo. But um, I stubbed my toe a lot. I'll say they, they, they were, they were not necessarily ready for some of the big company <laughs> process. So I, so I they, learned they, a lot. They thought they were, but they weren't actually culturally ready. Was there anything that you tried and didn't work or something you tried and did work in terms of bringing over from Disney process? Yeah, I, I think there's two examples. One was I formed these teams that I was very used to at Disney. I don't think it's um, unique to Disney that you have this business partner relationship between a head of a business and a CFO of a business. And I worked really hard for every GM that Yahoo had. And at the time, there were a lot of them. They had, I think, 14 different PLs, if I'm remembering correctly. So 14 different heads of each of these businesses. And I brought in um, a different, I recruited and brought this, the best finance talent there was to be a business partner to each one of those PLs. I also had a corporate um, financial plan, if, you know, FPNA group. So I had the business unit CFOs reporting to me and the corporate um, ops planning uh, uh, team um, reporting to me. And then I integrated what they called business operations, which really was the owner of all the revenue accounting and all of the analytics that drive revenue um, that was sitting outside of finance. And I brought that into finance because the rest of the finance team was really just focused on the cost side of the equation. And it really felt like those things needed to be get uh, brought together. So that worked almost not, not everywhere, but for the most part, we, we, I think we got a very nice integration of those separate groups. I don't think what, what didn't work as well that we did a lot at Disney is we'd say it was a little bit of a hands-off corporate hands-off approach to financial planning when the, the annual plan came around where we'd give targets and we'd say, you go figure out how you're going to get whatever 20% revenue growth and 10% cost savings or whatever, and come back and tell us the answer. Um, when we gave targets at Yahoo, I usually would, it would come back with 20% revenue decline and 30% cost increase. It was kind of a little bit of a, don't you tell me what to do attitude, <laughs> or at least that's how it, I experienced it. And so that was a surprise. Like it, it did, the, the um, input and output were not working the way I, I had expected them to, or the way it did work at, at Disney. So, so the, the discipline of the companies, the cultures were quite different. I remember when I was the CFO at Oracle, uh, people would say at Oracle, if you say jump, uh, the answer is how high. And then we acquired Sun. And if you say jump, people would say, why should I jump? <laughs> it's just a very, very, very different culture. That's and, a perfect That's a perfect analogy between Disney and, and Yahoo yeah. at, at the time. I think I, I, I think I had some good accomplishments while I was there and some that just um, that it was the wild, wild west a little bit. They weren't quite ready for that that process slash maybe I didn't have the right finesse to get it to get it done. Well, now I'm, I'm sure you had plenty of finesse. Now, this is the first time you had personal exposure to Wall Street, where at Yahoo, you were making your corporate budgets and getting ready for quarterly earnings announcements and things like that. Was that a new? I, I was not I was not investor facing, but the corporate fp a team was sort of the um, the team and the analysis behind what went into an earnings call. So I, I got to, I finally got the front seat to the theater of, a, of an earnings process. Whereas at Disney, you know, you had a whole investor relations division and I, and I was in consumer products or I was in, you know, the, the studio group or whatever. So you didn't ever get any exposure to those things. Um, similarly at, um, at Disney and to some extent at Yahoo, there'd be a whole tax department, a whole treasury department where you didn't really have to, if you're in a division, you didn't really have to, Right. think about those things or even in a, my corporate role you just turn to your tax partner and say um you know what's the answer and right. it was after yahoo where i started to become the cfo of the whole company that you all of a sudden you get oh i'm i need to know these things i need right. to know tax i need to know accounting and so that was the that was more of the the um the the pivot in terms of breadth so then after Yahoo, when you did become the parent company CFO and first at Etsy, where you now have responsibility for the whole range of finance experience, uh, in, in my experience, most CFOs either come from FP&A or from Wall Street or from accounting, sort of one of those three backgrounds. And you came from the very strong FP&A background. How did you think about 
developing your own skill set on the Wall Street side and on the accounting side? Um, I stand on the shoulders of a very strong team, and I've always used that credo everywhere I've gone. That and it's very similar to you think about. We we talked about these guys, Michael Eisner and Frank Wells, that came in and ran Disney in 1984. You know, they both came from film studios. What 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 did they know about running a theme park? Well, nothing at the you know in the beginning. They hired great people that knew a, a whole lot about those things, and I think that same philosophy holds true in the finance function, probably for other functions too, but we all come up through one rung or another. And I, the very most important, I'm not a CPA, the very most important person, particularly in a public company CFO role for me has been to have a phenomenal chief accounting officer. And that was, I, you know, I hired a, a great person in that role. Her name is Marilee Buckley. She's actually right at this moment attending her first board meeting because she's on a board. And um, sh that is a super important thing is to have people on your team that you can trust, that you can learn from, that that actually tell me what I what to do. I mean, I give direction on here are the priorities. Here's the information you need to know to do your job. Here's how much I want to invest in this function. But she'll come back to me and tell me, um, you know, here's our issues and here's our three alternatives. And I rely on people like that. I have somebody that leads tax for us. It's also phenomenal. Um, we have a really strong investor relations function and I, I'm the proverbial conductor of the orchestra. My first CFO role uh, was at King World Productions, which had, uh, it's a television programming company with Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy and Oprah Winfrey. So they had three very profitable, successful shows essentially no problem with capital raising or any internal issues. It was it was just about the easiest CFO role you could imagine to, for a first time CFO. But when you joined Etsy, you joined at a very challenging time. It, you had activist investors involved, but there was, there was turmoil. Tell us about what life was like when you first joined Etsy and how you, how you addressed that. I think all my career, I've sort of been attracted to creating order out of chaos. I don't know why, but I think one of the reasons that I was a, a good candidate for the CFO role of Etsy was that um, I had done a fair bit of sort of operational improvement projects at various places, various companies and various roles that I've had and um, business optimization. And um, this, <clears throat> the, CE, the CEO of Etsy um, that hired me actually departed just shortly before I started. And the CEO now, Josh Silverman, and I ended up joining the company almost at the same time, but he, he is a very, he's the exact right CEO for the situation that we found ourselves in at the time. And the former CEO was the exact right CEO to get the company to the scale that it was at. Very technology focused, very focused on the product. And um, Josh Silverman is very operationally focused. I was focused on why are um, costs increasing so fast much faster than top line is increasing. Why is the top line decelerating? How come margins are contracting? How can we be investing um, significantly more in marketing, but not willing to commit to um, to commit to any ROI on that investment? And those that's like my my bread and butter to get in and figure those things out and figure out how to help the company scale. And I think I was well suited for those things. So you're right. There were at the time activists that were asking the same questions. And Josh and I just happened to start right at the, about the same time. And our answer was, we agree with you, <laughs> you know? So it was a kind of an easy, um, very fulfilling, like we agree with you. And we, we had a challenge to, right away. We had no time to waste. We really had a challenge to get in there and demonstrate that this company can actually, you get down to your fighting weight and that it can actually do better by, by um, being focused on fewer things and being more nimble and agile than we had been before. So you asked all these key questions. You and Josh were both asking the same questions the activists were answering, were, were asking. And, and what were the answers to those questions? What did you find as you learned about the business? We, we found a couple of key things. We found that the company was focused on, we actually took an inventory, 800 different initiatives across the whole company, like far Eight, too many, 800. 800. And so we, we first prioritized what are the, what we called 
we separated the vital few from the worthwhile many. And I have to give full credit to Josh for that phraseology, but that's, we still use that today. So we focus on the vital few. There's a lot before I think the bar had been, is it a good idea? Yes, let's do it. And so not all good ideas are created equal. So we got good at that prioritization. So I I have to ask when you finished the prioritization, how many were on your list? 40. You went from 800 to 40. Yes, but we rolled we we rolled through the forty. You know, like you finish forty and you you you, yeah. you stack rank the next forty, and some of them you're never done actually. Yeah. And then we also if said you're, if you're number forty, maybe you never get done because something else is always higher. Possibly comes up. Well, yeah. maybe that's the second thing. I'll bump to the top of the, the the list in the answer to your question. We we got it. We really developed a, a culture of. Um, being metrics driven and ROI focused. So we today still have what we call our monthly metrics meeting where we have, it's probably a hundred people in this meeting, but everybody comes through and reports on their, their KPIs and including what's the ROI on this product experiment that we're running. Did we deliver what we said we were going to deliver? And we do not, we're not afraid of um, presenting failures. So everything's measured. Um, the the next thing was we also looked at how we were structured. So we had a ratio for every one product manager, there was one or two engineers, thus the 800 projects. And the right ratio is something more like one product manager to six to eight engineers. So when we took out a piece of white paper and said, okay, which are the 40 projects and which are the, how many squads do we need for those 40 projects? You end up having a natural rationalization of people that more people than we needed. And also we had a lot of people in the, what was the infrastructure side of the business. And it it took us longer to shift more away from infrastructure and um, into product development and things that were going to affect the top line because the company had invested a lot in building things from scratch rather than relying on companies like Oracle, um, who, whose core competencies were things like cloud computing. We were in um, a bunch of different data centers with you know hundreds of you know servers that each had very long lead times to um, to to add to add or or to, um, deploy and very costly. And we said we don't need to be in this business of running um, a server farm. Let's let's re- let's rely on a third party to do this. And in doing that relying on other companies. Another example is our um, member support. We rely on Zendesk and being able to outsource these things allows us to focus more of our internal resource on the things that are our core competency and not have to have core competencies across the board on all of these um, things that other third parties can do for us. It sounds like you made a number of changes. Uh, How long did it take from the time you started to the time you felt like uh, things were well underway where where you had you had it close to where you wanted it to be well we did it in six weeks we did we had a reduction in force of about 25 percent because and that was just a natural we didn't set out with a number we said what are the 40 what are the 40 most important projects and how many people do we need to do them and it just naturally um came about and so we were immediately delivering higher profits by the time we exited 2017 as we t- entered 2018 we were back to accelerating growth on the on the top line and we had a we we had we coined another phrase we called it watermelons on the floor not just low hanging fruit but <laughs> there are actually watermelons rolling around we had a lot of um wins that we knew when you think about it in terms of a triage you've got your vital few and some of them are easy and fast and big and some of them are harder and take longer. And so we really wanted to get some good wins rolling as we, as we started. And so by 2018, we were back to the growth mode and we've been growing. We, in 20, early 2019, we put out long-term growth goals. And then as we entered the pandemic, we had another step up um, from a tailwind of, of lockdowns, but, um, it took us, it took us probably that a full year to really get top and bottom line in the, uh, in the direction that we wanted it to go. I want to come back to the pandemic in a minute, but first I've never heard the phrase watermelons on the floor. I love that phrase. Do you have a favorite watermelon on the floor that, that you took advantage of? There, there's a couple that we rely on. One of them, we call it seven simple words. We just put on the checkout page, 
sell the seller never sees your credit card. Um, and it was to assure buyers that there's a corporation that sits behind this purchase. You may be buying jam from Susie and Joe's jam shop. You don't know who they are. And just putting those words just instilled such trust and confidence in that there's a company that's going to, that takes your, um, your, uh, personally identifiable information very seriously. It's going to be protect, protected. We're going to assure your purchase. Another, another one was the very simple, um, consumer psychological, uh, strategy of seven people have this in their cart already. And there's only one left, just the nudge signals and nudges, we call it, which was, uh, I think a little bit later, that might've been a 2018 implementation, but it, it delivered with a easy, um, some easy implementation, a big, you know, outsized um, uh, yield on the top line. So you talked about experiments. So you, you ran a lot of these experiments on the website itself to run A-B tests and to see what would increase conversion and uh, things like that. Yeah, we're very big experimentation culture. One of the homegrown things we did build that we've kept was very proprietary to us. We love is a system, an experimentation platform that enables us to see. We're, we're blessed with a very huge audience. We have like 200 million unique people that come visit Etsy all the time. So we can get signal on experiments very quickly as opposed to smaller sites that might need to run an experiment for longer. So we, we run these experiments and if it's a neutral or a win, we often roll it forward to a slightly larger audience until it's out to everybody. But we always keep a persistent holdout on the experiment so that we can go back three months later or a year later and test our thesis. Was it actually a win or not? So um, data scientists in the engineering group, and then I have an analytics team that's with it, that sits within finance that sets up a lot of the experiments and thinks about the measurement and their impact on the PL. I served on the board of Booking Holdings for 16 years, which owns Booking.com and Priceline. And, and we, before the pandemic, we were spending $5 billion a year in advertising, running thousands of experiments. And we had this concept called HIPPO, highest paid person's opinion. So someone would come up with an idea and we'd say, well, that's just a HIPPO. Let's run an experiment and see what the data is. Your opinion is, it's an interesting idea, but it's not going to tell us whether it's right or not. We have to run the experiment. So that's, that's just a terrific uh, philosophy for for internet companies. Now, uh, when COVID hit, everyone was worried that what's gonna happen, we're gonna have, the world's gonna be locked down. I, I remember I started buying masks on Etsy. I guess millions of people were buying masks on Etsy, right? That was, your, your, your business grew quickly at the beginning of COVID, right? Yeah, well, we had an initial like big gulp where our stock dropped, our, our sales dropped. And in the first two weeks, we we actually got on a call with our investors to say, look, this is a, you know, this is an unprecedented time, but even in our worst case um, scenario, we would still be a profitable company. We, we have this great business model where we, we don't have to hold inventory or invest in infrastructure for warehouses and things like that. So initially it was scary. And then the, the CDC reversed itself. Initially, if you recall, the CDC said, don't buy masks. We need to save them for the frontline workers and they're not going to do you any good anyway. And then somewhere in the beginning of April, they said, oh, oh, we changed our mind. Everybody should buy masks, get one wherever you can. Well, you couldn't find them anywhere. The, the largest other e-commerce player that you all know well, you couldn't buy anything. You couldn't even get toilet paper from them. And our army of sellers who know how to sew <laughs> kind of rushed into the, the um, to fill the need by sewing face masks. And we actually helped them a lot during that period of time, because here were sellers that were used to selling, shipping 200 items a week, all of a sudden getting 20,000 orders a week. So we really helped them throttle the traffic and pr communicate with the consumer on the site and through our member support organization. Um, you know, be patient. Here's when you're going to get it, or we're going to refund your your order because you're not going to get it. And here's other sellers that can. And we, the sellers were very agile in that moment. And Etsy was very agile in that moment. And it, what it did was we introduced millions of new buyers that probably had never heard of Etsy to the experience. And lo and behold, we sell a lot of things besides face masks. And so that really became a huge tailwind to us during the, the next couple of years. Who would have predicted that? Incredible. Well, I, I want to talk uh, in a minute about your experience as a board member. You're on the board of the New York Times, which, of course, is such an important institution in addition to being a fascinating business. 
but before we do, I want to tell people in the audience that uh, we're going to open it up to questions. So if you please post in, uh, I'm not sure if we're using Q&A or chat, but if you can uh, post the question, we're happy to take questions from the audience. Uh, tell us about the New York Times, uh, your experience there. I, I grew up reading the New York Times for my whole life, and uh, I actually worked at the Washington Post uh, company early in my career, so I, I have a <clears throat> love for newspapers. I'm reading uh, the biography of Eugene Meyer now, who who was Catherine Graham's father and mm -hmm. bought the, the Washington Post in 1933 out of bankruptcy and built it into this incredible institution. So. I personally love newspapers. So just to tell us what's it like to be on the board of the New York Times. Love it. It's one of those brands that um that I just that just resonates with me that I admire, that I feel proud to be a part of. I've you know, it's it's such a collection of like unbelievable intelligence and um superb execution. Um I think the in that case, I have a lot of friends that'll say to me, you're on the board of the New York Times. And I have to say, you know, this has really little to do with, I'm not a journalistic genius by any stretch of the imagination, but it has to do with, um, they're in the internet business. Basically they are, they are selling digital subscriptions and they, they were also transforming from a model that was an ad based print business, transforming to a digital based, um, subscription business. And I have, lots of experience in the internet. I have also the traditional media background, as we talked about with, um, with, uh, with Disney, but I have a lot of, you know, since 2005, I've been in internet, internet based businesses. And oh, by the way, I checked the box as um, a finance, a female finance expert. So I checked a lot of boxes, I think, as far as what the New York times was looking for in a board member at, at the time. And I, I love the diversity of the board. Everybody comes with a di from a different industry or a different functional um, area of expertise. So we collectively represent a lot of perspectives that I think can be helpful to the management team. And it's a very respectful management team. So they they really do seek our input. So it's um, it's it's a very symbiotic relationship. I think we all learn from each other, um, and we. It, uh, like sometimes refer to it as what it must feel like to be a grandparent. I'm not a grandparent yet, but um, to go there and play with somebody else's kids for a little while and their, their set of troubles and challenges, and then, you know, and then go back to my, my day job and, and um, return to the, the, ch the uh, challenges that I have to deal with every single day. So I really enjoy being associated with that great organization. When I worked for the Washington Post company, uh, they would have the business meeting in the morning, and then at lunch, they would invite reporters from the Washington Post newspaper to come in and talk about the issues of the day. And we had people like Warren Buffett and Bob McNamara, McNamara on our board. So they were, the board was very engaged in the public policy questions as well. Did, is that part of your board experience? That's the perk. Um, it's a very, this board, you know, we don't even get free uh, New York Times subscriptions. We everybody pays for their own subscription, but the the if you will, if you want to think about it as a perk, is we get the benefit of meeting the reporters, um, being able to have dinners with them or have them on a panel and having um, Q and A. The last board meeting we had um, the CEO um, of Netflix come in and talk to us, which was really an interesting experience and then we also had a panel of first amendments the, the uh the attorney for the new york times that represents them for you know the free speech and freedom of the press and a lot of um uh academians that are studying uh, freedom of the press and a panel of those which you can imagine the new york times where um you have had a former administration calling everything fake news and how that has um, compromised journalists' safety and ability to to do what they do, which is find the truth. It's a very interesting, it was a very interesting panel and um, uh, to, to get the their perspectives on um, where we stand today. Well, thank, thank you to you and to the leaders of the New York Times. It's such an important institution uh, and free press is what makes democracy great. It's, uh, it's just wonderful to be associated with that. Uh, I'll turn to some questions now. Nathaniel Brooks is asking, uh, first of all, he, he wanted to thank you and, and uh, was interested in your early training in psychology and organizational design. 
And he asks, what do you see as the two or three most essential skills for a CFO? And then secondly, how can you develop those skills? Great question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, some, though I'm not, you know, many CFOs will say, I want to be a strategic business partner. I'm not, I'm not the classic quantitative technical accountant. Um, you have to have some degree of financial curiosity, I think is the first thing. So that would be the number one skill is I, even though I'm not necessarily the accountant, um, I'm not a mathy person. I do very much like to see what the data and the numbers are telling me. And so honing that skill or or finding that um, curiosity within yourself, I think is is an important thing for a CFO to do. You, I take in I take data, analyze it, and make decisions based on it. And that with those decisions, I can support not only the CEO of our company, but the other leaders in the company. And that's that's one thing. The second thing is I'm very much a people leader. So I I have been able to form bridges. When I first entered Etsy, for instance, there was a silo between, it took me a while to figure this out, between the accounting team and the FP&A team. And so I bring those teams together. I mean, they we work better when we're together. And I had somebody just comment to me today, actually, about how well our team works together, how I've, I build the bridges between the people and together the whole is the sum, is the sum of, uh, the whole is better than the sum of its parts. And then I'd say um, maybe the, the last skill is um, I think what I've, what I've done the most as a CFO that I didn't have to do as a financial analyst or another more junior role in, in a finance organization is be outward facing. So I deal with our board. I deal with Wall Street. I deal with large institutional partners like our auditors and tax teams. And it requires a little bit more listening and a little bit more patience and being a little bit measured in when and how to respond. I think I've had people tell me in the past that I somehow, um, they said this affectionately, but Rachel doesn't have an edit function. I think I was a little, spi <laughs> I, I, I was a little spicier when I was younger, I think I'm still probably a little spicy, but, um, you know, you have to kind of pause and listen. So, so learning that, um, sort of, uh, sitting back a little bit rather than always leaning forward is a skill to be developed. Uh, Rachel, a little spicier. That's very interesting. Uh, we have a question from Abhishek Tiwari, who says that it seems like you became an accidental CFO coming from a psychological, from a psychology major, uh, is that true? Did you did you think of it as an accidental CFO, or had you always planned on it, or what did you think your career was going to be like? I I have called myself that before, but I I think <laughs> I'm always embarrassed to say that as the the CFO of a public company. I didn't intend to go into finance, and like I said, I'm not even a particularly mathy person. What I am though is very. Um, I think I'm very analytical. I, like I said, I like to take information and use that to make decisions and I'll keep, keep digging deeper to, to um, get the answer. In fact, that's one of um, one of the, the five core values that we, that we um, really cherish at Etsy is digging deeper, really questioning things and not accepting um, the first glossy answer to things. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of paths that I could have taken and probably ended up in a role pretty similar to the one I'm in, whether it was in finance or CEO or chief marketing officer, the idea of leading people, taking information to make decisions, that's sort of more of a characteristic than a skill. And so ending up in finance, though it's not what I planned, it's it's very suitable and fulfilling to me. That's, that's terrific. Uh, we have a question from the audience to talk more about your work-life balance as a working mom and obviously an enormously successful career. How do you do it? Yeah, it's tough. I tell, I don't know if this is coming from a, 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 a dad or a mom, but it really applies to, to all genders that there is no right answer. Um, and you should feel good in your own skin whatever path you take. So for instance, I told you that I worked um, half time for a while at Disney and that actually pushed my career to more on a low boil during that time. Maybe it wouldn't be so today, but at the time for Disney, that's 
what I did, I kind of took a bunch of projects and roles that didn't progress me forward, but I felt good about doing it. And when I was ready to re-enter the workforce, I was able to, um, I was there, I was the best qualified. I didn't have to say, hello, remember me? I'm Rachel from 10 years ago. I was able to just walk right into a VP level role at Disney. Um, I know other women, one other role model that I had at Disney, she worked like with her hair on fire while her kids were younger just kept on going, but she retired when they, uh, when her oldest one was seven. And so she made a lot of money on the, the equity that she earned at, at Disney. And she still retired when she was young and where her kids were still young enough to get a lot of her time and attention. And she did it sort of the inverted way than I did. And then yet a third role, role model that I had at um, Disney and these women, by the way, I stay in touch with, and I call them my friends to this day. The third one worked full-time, didn't do any half-time, didn't retire, anything like that. But she just made the kids the priority the whole time. So she'd schedule herself out of office for two days, two afternoons a week to go to the mommy and me. She didn't attend anything in the evening or on a weekend that didn't involve her kids. Um, so she declined all the the dinners and things that would happen. And she just put the kids first. So there's those are three models. I, I know there's other models too, but um, they all have their pros and cons. People used to tell me you have the best of both worlds, but sometimes I felt like I had the worst of both worlds because when I um, was with my kids, they weren't going to take, Hey, I have to go to a dentist appointment or, you know, get my hair done. They'd be like, wait, you've been gone from me half the week already. You're mine now. And, <laughs> and I wouldn't dare schedule the dentist appointment on the, on the days that I was at the office. Cause they'd be saying, no, schedule those on your days that you're not in the office. So it was like, you couldn't ever get any time at all that what you could call your own. So, um, yeah. that's my story. So how many years did you work part-time? I think it was nine in total. Nine years. So that's a, yeah. obviously a big, yeah. big, big yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Junsun Park, who uh, says uh, they became a reporting manager from a staff accountant, uh, and they would like to be a CFO. So what do they need to do to become a CFO? Do you recommend going to business school, or are there any intermediary steps they have to take with, from the accounting background and then financial reporting background? Yeah, I think um, I I personally don't think you have to go to business school or get your CPA or I you know I, I but I some companies you know I can't say that cleanly. Some companies might say I only want somebody with not only with an MBA but an MBA from X school. So that's that's a possibility. But generally, I think you can learn so much just by working hard in great companies. So I would suggest you um, think about what are the companies that you're working for and are they giving you a good experience or are there people around you that you're going to learn from? And as I said earlier, I think it's a, it's incumbent on you as well as your manager to be thinking about your career path and your career mobility. So if you think you want to be a CFO, what other parts of the, the finance organization do you need experience in and plot that course? Go have lunch with the person that's in fp &A, learn about their job, Make them think of you as the next best hire when they have an opening and take some of that um, networking onto yourself because it, otherwise it, it might not, not uh, magically or naturally happen from the chair that you're in. But I think you can take a lot of the steps necessary to um, get more of the functional experience across the uh, finance spectrum um, in the company that you're at. That's great. Uh, you, Rachel, you've talked about uh, your relationship with Byron Pollitt. Did you have other mentors and how did you develop a relationship with them and how could people on this call uh, develop similar relationships with terrific mentors? I think you have to, I'm, I, I pretty much, I, I have, yes, I had other mentors. I think you have to do a really good job and really listen. I mean, that's a, a, actually a very good lesson that I learned, really listen to what they want from you and um, check back in on that. And if, if they're pleased with your productivity and with your adaptability and your value add, the relationship is going to form from there. And it doesn't have to be a personal or social relationship in its business. So you have to earn your reputation with them and listen to what they have to say. I mean, really take, really leverage that experience. I, I happen to be lucky to work for brilliant people that I have learned so much from, but if, had I been like, you know, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to hear what you're, you're saying. And just, you know, I'm going this direction and really not taking on that, that feedback on board. You, you might get stuck. 
So my, my takeaway from that is when you think about your career, what company you might want to work for, work for a company where they have leaders like that who you could learn from and where you could personally work in that person's organization. That's a big part of choosing which company to work for. I um, agree with that. Although if you were to put my career path on a chart, you'd see that I went from some large, great ones to some small, not so great ones. And I I did learn a lot at the not so great ones too, where one company, I, it was a private company, I was asked to come in and help be the responsible, experienced pair of hands to a very young CEO. And it was really hard, but I learned so much from that really hard part. So maybe going back and forth, both learning from others and then learning on your own by being yeah. thrown at the deep end. Yeah. Uh, well, we'd love to answer on, uh, we'd love to end these uh, conversations with two key questions. One is, what's the best advice anyone has ever given you? Um, well, one one piece of advice that I used recently at an all hands at, at Etsy that was given to me by a finance professor that at the time I, I thought, well, that's kind of like motherhood and apple pie, but it's actually it's great advice, um, and I value it to this day. They he said always save six months of salary as go to hell money. That if you ever feel that your val your values or your integrity is being compromised in any way, that you have the ability to turn around and walk out that door. And I think that's an important piece of advice that you have stability, that you don't have to ever work anywhere that you feel like you're not learning or that there's you're being asked to do something that doesn't agree with your your own code of conduct your own principles what a powerful ability to do that to to be able to to leave if you have to uh, and then the last question is if you were going to write a cfo playbook uh what's one thing a cfo or someone in the finance department can do tomorrow morning uh to help uh, help them in their career or in their business yeah i think um it's a great question. I have to think on that one for a quick second. Um, I think it's really listening to your partners. Um, and I said this just before, it's really listening to what your CEO needs most um, and being adaptable and resilient to that thing. So, so take some time, to, whoever your partner might be, for instance, I have people on my team that are the business support, you know, the finance support for product or for engineering whoever you think your key partner is, and really make sure you're checking in um, on some uh, kind of a recurring basis to, to listen to what their priorities are and think about how you can be most helpful rather than trying to push the agenda that you think is the most important. Well, terrific advice. Rachel, what a pleasure to spend some time with you today. Thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and ideas. It's been a wonderful session. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. It really has been fun to talk to you.